today on Know How. TVs, gaming monitors, and sound for your gaming system. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Know How is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Take back your internet privacy today. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash knowhow. And by Hover. Register a domain name with Hover and build your online brand today. Go to hover.com slash twit and save 10% off your first purchase. Welcome to Know How. Did you like that Hadouken, Sam Iskovich from Ars Technica? I really enjoyed that, Jason Howell from Twit.tv. <laughs> See, we don't have to introduce ourselves anymore. We can introduce each other. I like it this way. How you doing, Sam? I am doing great. Happy to be here for yet another episode of Know How Gaming. Yeah. I don't know if that's the specific term for this every week, every Thursday, look at making your gaming space the best possible. Uh, I think, I think we works. got a bunch of cool stuff this week that isn't necessarily about the systems that we play on, but about kind of the stuff we need in order to play them. Yeah, I mean, it definitely touches on the systems that we play on, and I think we're going to focus a little bit on uh, kind of the, the visual elements of things, whether you're playing with consoles in your living room or maybe consoles in your computer space or even a PC gaming space, uh, and then kind of dive in a little bit later into kind of the elements of sound and the ways that some of these systems attempt to make things a little more immersive for you. Maybe that's not the best way to go. But yes, absolutely. Let's start with visual because obviously when you're talking about video games and especially nowadays, I mean, you know, I, I've been a fan of video games for a very long time as I will surely, you know, <laughs> reveal time and time again, my history in gaming firmly lies in the retro kind of era of gaming where visuals were maybe a little bit less uh, less dynamic than they are now, so you had to use your imagination to really fill in the gaps. But now, you know, these consoles are and, and PCs are so capable that the visuals almost look like hyper realistic. So you need a good TV or a good monitor to kind of represent that stuff, right? A absolutely. I mean, we're in a different era where what you get in a new generation of hardware, whether it's a console or a PC, uh, is going to be honestly about pushing resolution. Uh, that's sort of the biggest thing that you can kind of upgrade because processing power kind of maxes out in some ways in terms of just pure uh, gigahertz that are coming out. But in terms of video RAM and other kind of really detail-oriented stuff, that is growing and growing and growing. So as we get into an era in which a PlayStation 4 becomes a PS4 Pro and an Xbox One becomes an Xbox One X, that ends up being about resolution and about seeing what that extra resolution shows off. So whether you're going to go all the way to 4K or you're sticking with 1080p, these are the kind of things you want. You want a, a screen that makes that stuff pop because we're not in the CR era anymore. We're not using scan lines and tubes that sort of fill in the visual cracks of limited pixels. We have all the pixels. We can see exactly where every pixel is, and we want a TV that really brings that stuff out. So when we're talking, so we're going to focus this first segment on TVs as opposed to gaming monitors. So when you're talking about buying a TV, like I, I uh, in, in our house, this is the year where we, my wife and I, kind of promised ourselves, all right, sometime this year we're going to upgrade our TV. Our TV is a 50-inch rear projection LCD from 2005. So it's dated, let's say. 1080i is the maximum resolution on this sucker. Wow. And I remember when we got it, it was a two grand TV, so it wasn't inexpensive. Now, you know, flash forward to where we are now, where everyone else is except us, and TVs are so inexpensive. And meanwhile, they're larger. You know, there's all those different acronyms and, you know, 4K, uh, HDR, all these different elements that improve the, the vision and improve the, the quality of the experience that you get. And the price range is really vary. So, I mean, when you're talking about gaming, there's got to be some aspects of these TVs that, you know, like a $300 50-inch TV, what, what would someone miss when they go for like that lower end or that budget large size uh, TV and decide, hey, I want to make this a gaming TV? 
I mean, there's a few things that you want to look into on a set by set basis. Simply going into a showroom and saying, I want a 1080p TV that is this big could miss some attributes. So I would say specs that are important. Resolution, you want to find out, are we going to get all the way to 4K? That may not necessarily be a thing you desperately want or need, but uh, sometimes 4K doesn't cost more. Uh, and there's not like a fake 4K. Either you're going to get that resolution, which is, if you want to be numerical about it, 3840 by 2160, which is four times 1080p resolution. Uh, if it says that, you're, that's not a trick. You're going to get that. Uh, now, re uh, screen refresh is one of those things that you're going to get into where you may be sold that your TV can support something higher than 60 hertz or 60 frames a second. That is usually malarkey because that ends up being a screen processing uh, thing that is tacked on. Sometimes we call this the soap opera effect, where your TV takes the information that it, uh, from your signal, whether it's your cable box or game system, and then processes that image and guesses what frames come in, in between, in interpolation. Uh, this pretty much always looks terrible. There's no uh, filmmakers, video makers, game makers design their products to refresh exactly as seen. So don't get s tricked if any of the, especially on the TV side of things. We'll go into those refresh rates uh, on computer monitors later. That's different. But if we're talking about something sold as a TV, unless it actually specifically is supporting a pure refresh that's higher than 60 hertz and has sort of an explanation about that, it's malarkey. So ignore that stuff. 60 hertz is going to be your standard for a television, certainly right now in 2018. Um, I, feel, I feel like I've seen so many TVs that tout like 100 or 120 hertz. And you're saying like, if they're saying that, it's not true 120 hertz. They're doing that inter interpolation to kind of fill the gaps and you don't want that. That can be the case. It, okay. tend, that, that it is sold that way. It tends to be less clear in a gaming monitor space that's different. Again, we'll get into mm -hmm. that. But with TV, mm -hmm. you always want to double check what the heck they mean and do research. Don't just assume that a TV sold in a big box retailer when it pronounces that many hertz is going to actually support that on crazy future systems or PCs or things right, like that. Right. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the technology that goes into how the pixel are presented and we're going to get into that I think that you would talk to me about wanting to know the difference between OLED and LCD I think that might be a good starting point yeah absolutely because I feel like you know when, when you're shopping for these TVs I mean man there's so many LED TVs out there I know on smartphones LED displays are great but OLED you know many people consider that to be better I mean does that translate into the TV space is that going to affect the cost and as far as gaming truly you know a true representation of, of the content within your game like does it matter matter between those two? I would say, yeah, you're spending a lot for the difference between those two, but let's break down what you're actually getting as a difference. Now, LED is simply a refinement of older LCD technology, which means you have uh, pixels that turn on and off. Um, it's I'm, I'm breaking it down kind of poorly here. You have a light that is always on when it comes to an LED or LCD TV. There's always a backlight that's on, and then you have pixels that are changing the color information on the fly very rapidly. Um, this is a very cheap thing to do, to just have an always on light panel behind the pixels uh, that's shining through. Uh, and you end up with a lot more refinement in that space, a lot of regional dimming that'll happen, meaning that backlight that's always on can go dimmer uh, in certain dark scenes. Uh, OLED, the reason I bring that up so technically is because OLED, what the big difference is, is that these are organic light emitting diodes, uh, which means they can turn all the way off. There's no backlight. All of the light is being fed. There's a, sort of an electrical signal that'll turn each pixel on an OLED on, on a case-by-case -case basis, on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis, which means on an OLED panel, you can get what's known as an infinite contrast ratio, meaning you can have a pure black with those bright brights on the other side. You can have an incredibly bright pixel right next to an incredibly black pixel. Uh, and when you're watching something that is cinematically framed, and sometimes in gaming that can really pop, you will notice that difference. Whereas with an LED or LCD panel, you are always having some sort of light bleed. And again, newer LCD and LED panels manage this better, do it smarter. Some companies like Samsung have what they call quantum blue light technology. Okay. And that lets that backlight that's always on at least go to a really dark blue hue, which is close to a pure black. Uh, the point being, you may not notice 
any of this if you're going to be gaming in a bright room. Uh, OLED is kind of terrible in terms of its really cool qualities if you have natural light beaming in because that infinite black ratio comes at a cost, which is that OLED panels tend to not be as bright as LED and LCD panels. Honestly, whatever brightness of a room you have, however much natural light you're going to have in your gaming room of choice really will define whether OLED is even an option because while OLED offers those really awesome infinite blacks, infinite contrast ratios, uh, you generally don't get as much of a brightness. Uh, so before you go spending that $1,500 on going full OLED, say... Am I gonna be in a, like a cave when I'm playing these games? <laughs> if not, eh, you might want to stick with uh, LED, which you're still gonna get some significant brightness, better brightness, and you still will get to get some of these newer, awesome perks in terms of color and brightness and uh, range. Okay, that all makes a lot of sense and makes my uh, purchase decision that much more difficult and probably more expensive. Because come on, uh, who wouldn't want OLED? Um, gaming mode. This is this is a question that I, I have had in the past. Whether this is just like hype or branding, you know, a lot of times with technology, they fit things in there and give it a fancy name and, and it looks really good on a spec sheet, but what does that really translate to? What is a gaming mode that you find in the settings on your TV and how important is that? I think pretty much every television manufacturer in 2018 has a very simple path to a game mode because there's a lot of these sets that add extra picture refinements and interpolation and smoothing and automatic color adjustments and things like that. And these all add milliseconds between when the image is rendered uh, on whatever your source device is and when it is actually displayed. Uh, all of that stuff can get in the way between when you press a button in a game and when you see that happen in the game. Uh, in the era of Guitar Hero and Rock Band blowing up, this drove people insane. You actually had to use those games' calibration in order to sort of fake it out and be able to strum to the exact beat of the music, which was killer. Uh, depending on the game you're playing, that may not matter so much. You may be, may be able to turn on some of these sort of visual perks and get uh, that sort of benefit while still getting a, a, a good feeling game, something that's a little less twitchy. Maybe Assassin's Creed, where you're running around, climbing over buildings, and you can spare those milliseconds. But if you like anything in the way of twitchy gaming, and I don't know if you've heard of this game called Fortnite, yeah, but that's a game that is not only hugely popular, but also absolutely dependent on those split second reactions. Because let's not forget, when you're playing an online game, you're already dealing with little bits of input delay because you're networking, your signal's going back and forth, you're dealing with some sort of ping. So whatever you can reduce while playing a game, you need that game mode. You absolutely need to have it. Uh, honestly, it's going to be up to a matter of taste and the games you're playing, whether you want to leave game mode on and perhaps lose some of the dynamic uh benefits that you might get, especially on these sets that have these sort of local dimming features where an LED panel is adjusting its black levels all over the screen at different points. Um, you know, you might really want that for a slower, more nuanced adventure game, your Zeldas, your Assassin's Creeds. Whereas Fortnite, you might say, I need performance above quality. Give me that game mode. So sometimes that's really easy uh, on the set that you pick to just hit a gear button and it'll just let you pick on the fly, you know, standard, vivid game, you know, just as an easy toggle so you don't have to go digging through menus to then fine tune from there. Yeah, and I noticed uh, not too long ago, Xbox One integrated a feature that will actually automatically, and I'm sure this is just on some supported sets, will automatically activate uh, game mode on your TV. So you don't have to think about it because I would imagine, you know, that's just one more thing you have to think about, you know, uh, or maybe program into your universal remote to, you know, go into that gaming mode sequence when you actually want to play a game versus watch something on Netflix or something. Right, and that, that depends on whether the TV and the Xbox that you have play nice in terms of that HDMI communication, that there's certain ah. sort of signals that and you can send through HDMI to, say, turn uh, the television on or switch to the input in question. Uh, in fact, all modern game systems have these sort of buried in their settings just as a basic, I want my TV to be smart about right. when my game system turns on and switch to that input. So that's not a, necessarily a guarantee, but if, if you have that perk, yeah, toggle it.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then future proofing. Obviously, you know, <laughs> just at the, I think it was just IFA where 8K suddenly had its big, you know, big moment and 8K was everywhere, even though there's no content for 8K and no one really has 8K. It's like the beginning of this trend. How aware should someone buying a TV in 2018 or 2019 be as far as buying something that's maybe ahead of the curve? Obviously, that's going to be more expensive, but is that super important to do? So 8K, I'm not necessarily convinced that that is going to be a thing that happens in the next five years. Uh, now, it's stupid to, in any sort of smart technology space, say, oh, that's not going to happen yet because those people are always proven wrong. Yeah. But I think with television, what you should be on the lookout for, honestly, is HDR, uh, which uh, I am a huge fan of HDR when it's pulled off correctly. Uh, but the thing that's going to be coming down the pipeline perhaps in the next one or two years is that HDR, which high dynamic range to for people who don't know, is essentially the shortest version of putting it is that darker and brighter colors can coexist on the same panel. And you get these incredible things like drastic sunsets, these reflections within puddles, headlights on a car. These certain small elements can pop at a sort of a brighter both brightness and color luminance. So essentially you don't just get a brighter color, but also a deeper, richer version of that color. Uh, the, I know when I tested out uh, the most recent Gran Turismo game, I got to see it on an HDR panel and they said, yeah, we can reproduce certain car colors that you can't do on standard dynamic range SDR, which is essentially what's been in televisions since the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So that range of HDR is going to be brighter and richer in the next year or two years. That's not to say that HDR, HDR currently is bad, it's good. But if for any reason you look at that and say, I really wanna maximize that and I'm willing to wait, or I just got a TV two years ago and I'm willing to wait, that I think is kind of the more on the horizon difference that you should be thinking about before you say, am I gonna spend this much money now? Maybe I just get a cheaper, simpler HDR set now and wait until the really big deal one comes before I pump you know, $3,000 in a set at that point. That would be the biggest thing to weigh, I'd say, in terms of future proofing. Otherwise, I think 4K and 60 frames per second, those are sort of the standards that you have in television now. And while some people talk about 8K and talk about variable refresh rates, we'll get into that later. Um, I'm not so concerned about those in the TV space in the next one, you two, one to two years to come. All right. And finally, before we kind of close this thing out, I'm sure everybody's wondering, I'm wondering, what uh, what game, what TV do you have in your living room? Because I guess, I'm guessing that you bought your TV based around buying a good gaming TV. What do you have? I did. I opted for what has was the de facto standard set in 2016. That was LG's B6. This one, even though there were other num uh, sets in the OLED line at that point, that one actually uh, was rated best for just a pure game mode and I'll still offered HDR10, which is sort of the current standard that you can get that on uh, 4K Blu-ray and streaming services. Uh, and the biggest drawback with that one is that when my, there's anything bright in my room, it's just not that maximum brightness that I would want. So I have to really draw the curtains and blinds in order to get that really awesome refresh rate, those sort of instant pixels that you get out of an OLED and that incredible rich color. Um, now, the interesting thing about LG's OLED line is it hasn't really changed very much. You're getting thinner sets and sometimes the refresh rates are a tiny bit faster, but the 2018 OLEDs, pretty close to the 2016 OLEDs. Um, we're not sure what it's gonna take for them to really buck anything in terms of performance on those other than uh, compatibility with higher level um, versions of HDR. Dolby Vision in particular is the one that has a greater luminance range. And there's other sort of versions of HDR. I know the BBC has their own, and I forget the acronym for it, but Planet Earth uh, 2 debuted with it as an over-the-air standard. Uh, and that is going to roll out in more uh, hardware in the years to come. So I think if you have the money, th those OLEDs are expensive. That's 1800 bucks. Now, barring that, if you're looking to get a television that does the trick, I would honestly look at the 4K sets that TCL makes. TCL has essentially, I don't know if anyone was buying TVs years ago and has fallen out. I remember when Vizio was sort of the king. They yeah. had high responsive, really responsive screens like in terms of gaming performance for cheap with good color balance. TCL has taken that over. 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's going to be the absolute best set in terms of wowing everybody compared to what the most expensive OLED you can find. But for an LED panel that is affordable, that will get you 4K and that will get you responsive refreshes, you can start with TCL and you can save money. And the difference between 4K and 1080p right now is nil. So if you are going to go get a set, don't try and save 50 bucks by shrinking down to 1080p. If you can get 4K, get it. Your 1080p stuff will still look great. And it's nice to just have that option in case you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to go for 4K because 4K plus HDR, that is the equation. Some people don't notice only 4K. Some people don't notice only HDR. But that's the peanut butter and chocolate of a really good home theater and gaming. It just looks really nice. The effect of one really helps the other and vice versa. Yeah, dang it. Now I got to have some peanut butter and chocolate. You're making me hungry. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, okay, so we're going to take a break and then we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of the gaming monitor side of things. We focused a little bit on TVs. What about monitors? And there's definitely some different technologies that integrate with gaming monitors uh, that we need to discuss before that. Let's take a break and thank the sponsor of this episode of Know How. This episode of Know How is brought to you by ExpressVPN. I'm an ExpressVPN user, and I got to tell you, they are awesome. And, you know, you might have a lot of Internet of Things things in your home. I know I do. IoT is everywhere in my home. It's making a whole lot of things a whole lot easier. Uh, now we can control thermostats, of course, uh, re do this remotely, get updates from our fridge on what food we actually need to restock. It's making everything s simpler uh, in some ways. Uh, but increased convenience comes at a price. An unprotected IoT device is a goldmine for hackers. Many devices weren't built with security in mind. It's a big problem. So to protect yourself, you can try ExpressVPN for routers. ExpressVPN runs a secure VPN directly on your router, which then encrypts internet data for every device on your home network. So even if those IoT devices aren't protected themselves, they're running through this router, this protected router, thanks to ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is the only VPN provider that we trust with protecting all of our devices. The ExpressVPN app for routers is super easy to set up, thankfully, and you can purchase a router with the firmware pre-installed if you want it to be even easier. Every device gets ExpressVPN protection the moment it connects to your router because all of that smart, all that smart stuff is embedded in the router. Everything passes through it, so it catches it on the way. An ExpressVPN subscription also comes with apps for computers, smartphones, and tablets, and that's going to give you on-the-go protection, uh, even when you're out of the house, right? Uh, you've got it running on your phone, so when you're at that Wi-Fi access point, you're protected. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and then hiding your public IP address. And what's even better, it costs less than 7 bucks a month. Take back your internet privacy today and find out how you can get three extra months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash knowhow. That's expressvpn.com slash knowhow for three extra months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash knowhow to learn more. And we thank ExpressVPN for their support. All right, so we looked at the TVs. Uh, now let's uh, talk a little bit about monitors. Gaming monitors seem to have a different focus to a certain degree. Like, I, I've always kind of run into this when thinking about the difference between TVs and monitors, where I'm like, well, TVs get larger and they're less expensive sometimes compared to these, you know, the same size monitor. Why the price is different, I never could truly understand. Why would you not want to buy a large uh, TV instead of a large gaming monitor? You know, I honestly am with you to some extent because now that we're in an era of LED and LCD televisions, we're sort of on parity with what you might expect from a digital gaming monitor. Uh, they end up having some of the same inputs. Uh, they end up just essentially recreating pixels instead of doing different sort of tube TV things like you might expect in the 80s and 90s. That being said, when you're in the gaming monitor space, you can get specific benefits and boons that are very much for gaming. You're not buying a computer monitor necessarily because you want to Photoshop better. This is often about aspect ratios and refresh rates. Uh, aspect ratios meaning maybe I want a wider field of view. Maybe I don't want just 16 by 9 because I'm playing a first person shooter mm. or I'm playing a car game or a flight simulator. The kind of experience where that peripheral vision of what's going on is really valuable to that interactive experience and the game in question is compatible with it. 
Uh, a that lot would, of these. Yeah, that was going to be my question is, you know, are, are the games, are all games, or I imagine top tier games, aware of the dimension of the re resolution of your specific monitor and they can scale to that or do they end up resorting to like stretching or how do they handle that? That is quite the discussion on many gaming forums up to this day. That's sort of whenever a new PC game comes out, often the first thing that people ask is, is it going to work with my monitor? So with aspect ratios, that tends to be the trickiest. But when you're getting into 16 by 10 and beyond, many games bake that kind of support in. Uh, it, it's becoming a little more standard, and I'm not sure, I can't speak directly whether that's a DirectX initiative. That's uh, one of Microsoft's gaming APIs that translates really nicely between uh, Windows and Xbox. I can't say if that's just more uh, gaming engines just supporting that by default. I know a lot of developers use uh, systems like Unreal Engine 4 and Unity, and these kind of flatly offer these features that go, well, you're making a video game that might be used on a gazillion monitors. Oh, we have support for all those in general. But some games have more uh, cooking that they need to do to support this stuff than others. Uh, it's really a game by game basis, but chances are if you're going into the hardcore space, something that's PC specific or targeted and advertised to gamers on PC, you're going to end up with these sort of wider ratios. Uh, but just don't expect it by default. You'll always want to double check. You do end up in a weird funny zoo of triple checking whether your favorite game will support a resolution. Um, so that's that's one of the trickier parts about gaming monitors, but they'll still in pinch stretch the image or letterbox it and be fine. When you're getting a wide a wider screen gaming monitor, you sort of know what you're in for. Uh, that you you may not get that support, but it won't break. It won't not work at the very least. And cur and curved monitors this is another question because I know I've seen this this new trend of these monitors that gently curve out, and I'm always wondering like, is that because it's more immersive, or is it a space consideration sort of thing? What are your thoughts on that for gaming? I've never been enchanted by them, and that was a trend, especially uh, as. 3D TVs and curved TVs were sort of happening at the same time. And yeah. I'm pretty sure both died a very similar death of people going, I don't see a benefit and I only see drawbacks. I think on a desktop uh, or a, a, a desk, you might get a little bit more benefit from a curve for what you're looking at. But very rarely are you getting anything other than an equivalent experience. It's rarely better. It's rarely designed to truly take your exact sight line in line. You're not really losing anything by re keeping a square monitor, a flat one. So don't don't jump to that if you don't have experience with it. If you haven't been able to go to a showroom and try it out, don't blindly order one of those off the internet and expect it to blow you away or be worth any sort of price premium. That being said, if you can find one in a fire sale and you're going to be using it at a desk right up to your face while you're playing your favorite shooter game, uh, save the few hundred bucks if you can get it in a fire sale way. So that's not necessarily a ringing endorsement, but... <laughs> But they exist and they're worth considering for uh, some scenarios. Um, I, I think the big topic that we want to kind of dive in here is really important. And I'm sure that this applies to a certain degree to TVs, but definitely applies to gaming monitors specifically. And that's refresh rates. What, what can you tell us about kind of this, this trend of, of variable refresh rates? I know in the monitors that I bought in the past is very much, it was fixed at 60 hertz or 70 or 75 or whatever. But now we've got variable refresh rates as a thing. What is that? Well, let me tell you, I do love a variable <laughs> refresh rate. Well, cool, I think I'll sit down and listen. Now. But the starting point really is that we have games that are still popular that were made years ago. We've got Counter-Strike uh, Global Offensive, which is not a very powerful game, but these are uh, League of Legends, Dota 2. Uh, you've got older games that are still popular around the world. Uh, and what are you going to do with the performance on those if you're not going to soup up the graphics? If the players love them for exactly how they look and perform. Well, refresh rates is a way where you take all that extra CPU and GPU that's not being taxed by these older games. Let's crank up the refresh rate. Instead of 60 frames a second, why don't we go up to 120 frames a second, 144 frames a second, maybe even 165 frames a second. Now, I don't have the science right in my hand. I'll tell you, you can notice a little bit of a difference between 60 and higher. Whether you'll notice a difference between 144 and 165 is anyone's guess. But hmm. that's sort of a starting point where you go, well, 
if my monitor clearly advertises 120 hertz or a 144 hertz, that can be a perk depending on the games you play. And now that these GPUs are getting so powerful, uh, if you got in before Bitcoin craziness and got one of the modern graphics cards, I mean, you can still get them now. The, the Bitcoin fever is dived just enough to where you can get something like a, a GTX 1070 or an equivalent um, AMD card. You can get modern games into the 90, 100 hertz rate. But once you're in that sort of in-between territory, not quite 60, not quite 120, one of these weird um, multiples that doesn't cleanly divide in, you get into the math issue of while well, these frames are popping up at slightly different rates and you'll see a little bit of judder now, that may not matter if you're playing a slow, chill game, but if you're, again, doing something really aggressive and intense, PUBG, Fortnite, Counter-Strike, you don't want that judder. You want that mouse movement and that keyboard movement to be smooth when you are gaming. So variable refresh rate says, we're just going to spit the image up as soon as it's ready. We're not locked to a specific exact clock rate for the screen refresh. So variable refresh rate lets you kind of go whichever way you want to go. If you want to have a game run less than 144 hertz, but turn on a bunch of bells and whistles, so you're kind of at like 68 frames a second, you won't get a bunch of judder. It'll just show up. If you want to go between 30 and 60 frames a second because you're cranking up a ton of settings, variable refresh rate will turn off those stutters. And once you're in that 30 to 60 range, those stutters are really noticeable. So anything that in the, that variable side really does help in the gaming space. And PC games are better poised to take advantage of that no matter what graphics card you have. V-Sync, I feel like V-Sync as a, as a, uh, a technology may be a little outdated compared to some of the other more modern versions of this. Is V-Sync one of these kind of variable refresh rates? Is it one of the earlier versions or is it something different? That's a good question because when you play a PC game, you'll often see V-Sync as an option. Yeah. V-Sync simply means locking your the refresh of a game to the exact hertz of your monitor. Oh, so it. a 60 hertz monitor, you'll want to V-sync that so that instead of uh, going above 60 or below 60, it tries to stay right at 60. So it's totally uh, that, the opposite of variable. It's like locking it in perfectly. <laughs> correct, but that's a good question because yeah, you fixed. hear uh, some of these other game uh, variable refresh rate terms. I think we should talk about those. Yeah. They're called G-Sync and FreeSync. They sound like V-Sync, but they're not. Right. V-Sync is just, <laughs> oh, I have a standard old monitor and I just want it to lock to that instead of like having this extra judder because it's running too fast. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then, uh, so that's more like the fixed version, uh, fixing your your refresh rate based on the monitor that you have to the game. And then we have these variable refresh rates technologies like NVIDIA's G-Sync, AMD has its Radeon uh, FreeSync. These require hardware, compatible hardware in order to do anything, right? This isn't going to work with everybody at right out of the box. Generally, yes. And that's one of my least favorite things about this trend of variable refresh rate, meaning if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, you know, a GTX 1080, a GTX 2080 Ti or RTX 2080 Ti. Sorry, I'm mixing up those confusing terms. But if you have a GeForce NVIDIA product, you'll want to have a G-Sync compatible monitor so that they are playing nicely and communicating with each other because it's the video card that's truly managing when the images pop up on your monitor. Conversely, if you opt for an AMD card, you're going to want to go for something in the FreeSync camp. Now, FreeSync is an open standard, uh, and recently there has been an NVIDIA uh, driver update that's, for whatever reason, finally enabled support so that you can take your NVIDIA card and play it with FreeSync. So that's good news for mm -hmm. NVIDIA card holders, although that is not um, a wide update. Uh, uh, it has not rolled out widely enough for me to say you're totally fine if you go with NVIDIA. But as of right now, thanks to a recent driver update, uh, we're filming this in September, so that might be changed by the time this goes live, uh, that you could get away with an NVIDIA card and a free sync monitor. But the other way does not work because G-Sync is locked down to NVIDIA. That's a proprietary thing. You can't take your AMD card or any other graphics card, slap it onto a G-Sync monitor and expect it to work. And these uh, compatibility, that isn't baked into the game itself. This is all purely in the hardware. Or 
our games V-Sync or, or sorry, not V-Sync. Sorry, I'm getting all my syncs mixed up. Uh, the G-Sync or FreeSync, does that have to be baked into the software itself or it's purely hardware? I just want to make a joke. It's everything but the kitchen sink. Ha! So, thank you. Thank you. I'll be here this week. So uh, the games, fortunately, are just spitting out the frames as fast as your computer can render them, unless they are made with a specific locked frame rate. And I've seen a couple of games that will ship with this and forums will explode. But that tends to be a rare exception, not a standard. So if your game can have V-Sync disabled, which is pretty much every PC game in the modern world, uh, it will work with either standard. Because at that point, the graphics card is taking those images, pounding them out, sending them to the monitor, and then hopefully you have that nice graphics card monitor interplay so that you can enjoy that variable refresh rate no matter which standard you're using. Got it. All right, uh, real quick before we get into the TV that you're using, uh, burn-in, is that still an issue? I remember it used to be an issue back in the day. Obviously, it probably depends on the technology of your screen, but what do you think? You know, that's interesting. You bring that up about in the computer monitor talk. Uh, and back in the day, computer monitors were definitely subject to burn-in. Uh, hence, uh, we had flying toasters. Yeah. Uh, now, what's interesting is it's OLED technology that is suffers the most from what's known as ghosting, where a constant image left on the screen will stay for a while until you run kind of a full reset because of the way that those um, organic uh, light em emitting the light emitting diodes work. They're designed so that if they're emitting the exact same signal or color, they'll kind of get stuck on that until they have a sort of wipe, and they can actually suffer from a true pure burn-in. Computer monitors, there are some in the OLED space, but it's mostly LED because you're looking for stuff that works in that higher 144 hertz range. LED LCD is currently just cheaper to do in that way. So you're not going to get a... It's already expensive to get an OLED panel at a fixed 60 frames per second refresh. You don't even want to think about the cost of going higher than that. So, uh, you know, on the TV side, if it's OLED, yeah, you want to make sure to have some sort of screensaver or some option in your console or PC. I have my PC hooked up to my OLED on occasion so I can get that full 4K. It's pretty sweet. Um, so you want to be mindful of that with anything in OLED. But in the monitor space, you're good. You do not need to pay after dark for a screensaver at this point. Got it. Okay, now... Uh, what do you have for your gaming monitor? I notice it's an LG, so apparently you like LG for your screens. I've been currently testing an LG panel that I'm really happy with. It's giant. It's a 32-inch. I'm blanking on its model name because it's got like 50 gazillion letters in it. GK850GB. <laughs> 32 but the point GB. being, this is a 1440p screen. Uh, it's got G-Sync, which works for me because I already have NVIDIA graphics cards that I test. Because quite frankly, if I just want the best performance right now, NVIDIA is it. That doesn't mean it's the best price per uh, frame per second or things like that. Uh, but it's got pretty solid color reproduction. But most importantly, importantly for me is that I can overclock it to 165 hertz if I want. Yes, I'm overclocking my monitor because I'm a crazy person. But it supports that if I so want to. It just draws a lot more power and doesn't really offer that much of a benefit. We've got solar panels at my house, so I've got a little bit of el extra electricity to burn through. Uh, yeah, it's just... It, oh, and it has this weird backlighting thing. So it kind of keeps the, the room contrast, this subtle thing, so you can turn the lights down in your room but have a color that kind of permeates on the walls so you can sort of live in a creepy basement video gamer way but still have your eyes not be completely attacked by the bright pixels on the screen. But this is not an HDR panel. This is simply 1440p, so it's not even 4K. But I'm getting... Uh, 1440p is above 1080p, below 4K. Uh, I, it doesn't look quite as crisp as a 4K monitor, but it's solid for what I want, which is high-speed performance in certain kinds of shooting games and racing games. So whatever I tap, I'm getting about as instant an update as possible. But the monitor space is definitely weird and fractured. You don't have, you. it's a little more specialized. You don't have necessarily as many people like you do with, say, TCL, going out and buying a specific model and kind of vouching far and wide across the internet that it's the definite panel for you. So uh, definitely in the PC space, the, the weirdest thing is that you often, when you're buying a PC monitor, is that you, you may get a stuck pixel. That tends to be a more common thing that you'll notice because your eyes are right up to it. Mm -hmm. So I think my biggest recommendation isn't so much a brand, but just be vigilant when you get that PC monitor. Make sure whoever you're buying it from is cool with you going, you know what? 
I got three or more stuck pixels, that's too many for me. I'd say yes. If you notice more than three stuck pixels, take it back, get your money back, get a replacement. That's kind of my bigger um, recommendation than necessarily which brand or don't don't worry about embedded speakers. That's my other tip. Embedded yeah, speakers that makes sense. inside of monitors stink. So don't worry about those. Yeah, don't worry about those because we're going to tell you next what you can do instead or what you should consider when you're searching for a sound system for your gaming uh, environment. So we're going to do that uh, after we take this break. Thank the sponsor of Know How. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Hover. Building your online brand has never been more important. You probably already know that. Your online identity begins with your domain name, and that's what Hover is all about. So you can domain name your passion. You can buy a domain name uh, and make that the first and kind of the biggest step to building your personal brand online. Your domain name tells someone who's visiting, tells the online community who you are and what you happen to be passionate about. If you picked it right, it's pretty easy to pick that apart from your domain name. Maybe you're a designer or maybe you're a creative professional. Uh, you could use dot .design as one example. You can stand out and brand yourself online with the perfect domain name for you or for your business. The best part is that dot .design domains are on sale at Hover for the entire month of October for $5.99. It's 85% off your first year. That's half the price of a dot .com. And what does the dot .com really tell you anyways? It doesn't tell you about the design aspect of your URL. Dot .design tells you everything you need to know. Web hosts and websites evolve as their brand, website, and hosting needs change. So keeping your domain separate from hosting also gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. No one wants to be stuck with a solution that doesn't quite meet their needs. That's no good. Hover offers the best-in-class customer support team no upsells, which is very nice. Hover Connect feature allows you to connect your domain name to many website builders with just a few simple clicks. And personalized email that matches your domain further supports your online identity because it keeps everything all tied together. Hover has over 400 domain extensions to choose from to help you brand yourself online. It's actually a lot of fun to see all of the different options that you can come up with. So go over there, check it out for yourself, and don't forget for the month of October, dot .design is on sale for $5.99, and new customers can get an additional 10% off of any of the 400-plus domain extensions uh, just by going to hover.com slash twit. That's 10% off your first purchase at hover.com slash twit. And we thank Hover for their support. All right, so we have all the visuals dialed in now. Thank you for your infinite knowledge and wisdom. Uh, what about sound? How important is sound? Because a lot of times I think sound ends up falling by the wayside. People put so much emphasis, so much importance on what they see with their eyes, and then they just have a pair of desktop speakers or something like that. Like, what do you think about that? See, no, that's Sam, how come back. Sound is. You just tricked me. <laughs> Dang, it, See, I you fooled do? you. That's not a technical difficulty. That's me <laughs> impressing upon you how important sound is. I mean, when you're talking about a video game and you're trying to get immersed in it and you're trying to be good at it, sound is going to be the difference between knowing where the shot is coming from and not. PUBG ushered in, in particular, a pretty interesting take on what had already been happening in a lot of these military sim games, which is positional sound. If the way that you hear um, a shot ping just with, with stereo speakers on is modeled in such a way that you're like, oh, that is probably coming from my left or behind me because it's an equal part of kind of the way the sound moves from left to right and the sort of sound effect that you sort of put those things together and go, oh, ah, I might die in this hundred man battle if I do not respond. So I would say absolutely crucial if you were trying to win at games and beyond that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of immersive sound that you get in games. This has been a trend that's been going for over a decade in terms of surround sound standards shipping inside of game consoles. I'd say really since PlayStation 2 in that era that every console has had some form of surround sound pushed. I remember GameCube had the Dolby Pro Logic 2 standard, which you needed a receiver. It took the stereo sound with like a little metadata in it and converted it. So you had to have that specific receiver, which was a pain in the butt. And now you have systems that have optical out and other sort of... Uh, receiver-friendly standards that'll pump out 5.1 and 7.1, whether you're using console for your games or using your console to watch movies or what have you. All right, so so 
supporting more of the multi-speaker uh, surround sound setups is one thing, but then we always always see, um, and I think we've talked about this at some point, either in prep or, or you know in episodes that we've recorded about this kind of like virtualized surround environment. That has to be information like when when, when the system is virtualizing a surround sound setup like that could possibly throw off the accuracy of the game you're playing, right? I would say yes. Very rarely should you turn on any hardware's virtual surround setting, meaning if the headset or speaker system you have give you a sort of virtual surround button, what that's doing is it's taking the stereo input that the game or movie maker has mm -hmm. built and then interpreting it. That always stinks because, again, the designer's intent is not to have its stereo sound twisted around and turned into something that seems swirly. Uh, that's All that's really doing is it's hunting for different frequencies and shifting them around so it seems like yeah. some of them are coming from behind or in front, but that's never going to give you accurate information on the gaming side of, oh, that shot's definitely coming from behind me and to the right. Uh, sometimes it can even just create a swishing effect that's distracting. That being said, there are exceptions. Uh, if a game itself offers some sort of surround option, you should probably consider it because the game is taking uh, what your system is into account. It'll know that it'll it'll if it has its own surround setting. I, Overwatch is one of these that it knows that you have headphones or speakers on and will adjust accordingly. Um, so they that, thought of it on their end, and they're the ones that created the experience. They want it to be as accurate as possible. So even though they're doing something in a more virtualized surround sound scenario. They're the ones making that op that decision as far as where sounds are coming from. It's, it's likely to be more accurate. Absolutely. You want to go with the artist's intent when yeah. it comes to sound design, whether you're listening to an album or you're getting into a crazy battle. You <laughs> yes. you want to trust that. But that leads me into something. I hope you don't mind me jumping ahead to Dolby Atmos. No, because do it. Dolby Atmos is what's the this, this option that's baked into Overwatch. Because Dolby Atmos is a thing that you are already in a game or a movie, it takes the signal and then is translating it depending on wherever and however your speakers are. So if you have uh, simply headphones on, that's a 2.0, meaning two speakers, zero subwoofers, it is interpreting whatever the signal is and saying, okay, we can do these frequency tricks so that it seems like a sound is at your above left or bottom right or behind you or below you, this sort of cone around your head, a fully of sound. That is Dolby Atmos processing exact positional audio. And if you want to go much bigger, you can have an unlimited number of speakers and multiple subwoofers plugged into Dolby Atmos. That means more than 5.1, more than 7.2, you could get to 18.4 which means you can simply take whatever speakers you have, whether they're Dolby Atmos approved or not, put them all around your room, calibrate them with the receiver, and then Dolby Atmos will take all that speaker information that it's already um, hard-coded because of uh, how you set it up, and then put little sounds all over your room so that when you're playing a compatible game or watching a compatible movie, those sounds will appear in this sort of cone around your head in the same way. That requires you to lock into a certain spot. You can't really move around your room too much. You'll lose a little bit of that precision. But I find that games are way more compelling for this than film. Because in a film, you've got the edit uh, of your perspective moving around constantly. The car in front of you may sh you know, immediately get behind you and things like that. But in a game, it's often a first person or behind your character perspective that's fixed. The audio is positional at all times. It's relevant. So Dolby Atmos is a very interesting prospect. Does it mean you need to upgrade from a 5.1 or 7.2 to enjoy it? I don't necessarily think so. But if you want to enjoy Dolby Atmos for cheap, you have to do something a little weird. You put on headphones and play with a PC game that's compatible, but you have to pay for a license. That's right. You have to be using Windows 10 and get the Dolby Atmos app within Windows 10. I believe the license is $15. That's what it was when I bought mine. Uh, and that point, then you have said, 
I deserve the right to try out this virtual surround. And it works great. I've actually tested it out with both games and albums. I have this REM automatic for the people remaster from last year. They remastered the entire album to take around this, this virtual cone effect. And all the instruments have this really awesome subtle quality as if you are in the studio. It's really killer stuff. It's a $100 box set though, plus the $15 license, plus whatever headphones you have. But Dolby Atmos is really cool. It's currently this thing that's only implemented in so many games. Not not in PUBG, not in every shooter, and you can't just fake Dolby Atmos into your game. So you'll whatever game you love, check to see what it's compatible with. But um, at the very least, surround sound systems uh, generally offer you a benefit on any console and any gaming system and PC. Most modern games if they have anything bombastic going on, you can toggle a surround and it'll at least do something to move sound into a 5.1 or 7.1 way. Just don't turn that into virtual surround yeah. using the headphone button. Again, you'll that's destroy a little the experience. Annoying. It's a little annoying because it is on a game by game case basis to some extent. But in the console world, you end up some with at least something a little more standard. If you're on a PlayStation 4 or Xbox One and you already have your stuff plugged in via optical or another compatible way into a sound system, that 5.1 and 7.1 system will give you what you're looking for. Um, sound cards, are they necessary at this point or are these systems usually shipping like gaming system? Obviously consoles, you don't have to worry about sound cards, but with gaming systems, I remember, you know, there was a time when sound card was essential. Now it kind of seems like you get this stuff out of the box, right? I guess if you want some support for Dolby Atmos, maybe that's baked into a, a special sound card. Uh, uh, no, you are looking at uh, motherboards on your PCs generally have a sound card baked in mm -hmm. uh, that does analog out and often does optical out. So the biggest recommendation I would have is look at the motherboard you're going for, see if it has optical out see exactly which audio outports it has, see if it supports uh, sending an additional audio out, both for microphone and headphone, to the top or other side of your PC if you are building your own. A lot of PCs, if you buy a full system that's already pre-made, will essentially have that. So you don't have to reach around the back of your PC to plug in your favorite headphones, and so that you can choose like either a one cord or two cord connector. Because sometimes you only need the one 3.5 millimeter jack, and that'll let you both listen and talk. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of that and that's about it you don't need it you shouldn't buy a sound blaster card in order to add more to your system i suppose if you have a really old pc or you bought the wrong motherboard and you still have a slot on right, your motherboard right. to add a card then sure go get a card but you're doing overkill you know you could we may reach a point in the future where motherboards video cards are so good that getting a separate video card is silly we've reached that point now with sound cards Ah, well, that's uh, that's going to save you some money as well. Uh, Sam Iskowicz, this is awesome. Really appreciate you sharing all of your insight on this once again. And there will be more. Oh, yes, next week we're going to have another episode. We're actually going to talk about network and cloud considerations, things like how to improve your performance, reduce ping times. Uh, we've got a gaming router that we can take a look at and kind of understand like what the difference is between a router versus a gaming router all these gaming focused things like is it marketing or is it something a little bit more that's next thursday's episode uh so you're just gonna have to you know come back next week or subscribe and, and watch and catch it then uh which we make it easy you can find links show notes past episodes subscribe links everything you need to know can be found at twit.tv slash kh new episodes every thursday air at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific uh, on the live page, twit.tv slash live, and then publish to this page, our show page, uh, shortly thereafter. Um, if you want to go over to Google+, Plus, you can find the Know How Google Plus community there. Search for the community. Just do a search for Twit Know How, and you'll find a community with nearly 12,000 other fans of this show all talking about the many topics that we have on this show, be it gaming, be it IoT, uh, makerspace stuff, everything and everybody's helping each other out and pitching in and it's really awesome to see the community kind of uh, reaching reaching out to each other and helping each other accomplish some really cool projects and stuff. Uh, Sam, you're always a busy person. Where should people follow your work? Uh, head over to at Sam Red on the Twitter. Uh, ArsTechnica.com hosts many of my words as well. 
uh, or just come over to my place in Seattle, play some video games <laughs> and all these board games. B, B, yeah, I know. I'm, I've been I'm analyzing the board games uh, while you've been talking. Um, have you have been to... Have you been analyzing all of the uh, N64 boxes? Oh, is that what those are? I was like, got a bunch those... of yeah, those are Japanese uh, N64 boxes that uh... are still in the plastic. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't even opened them yet. Well, they probably wouldn't work in your in your console, but that's okay. Oh, contraire. We'll oh, talk about well, that in some other episode. Sure. All right, all right. Sounds good. Uh, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter, of course, all over the Twit Network doing shows day in and day out. And, of course, we have our fantastic technical director, Josh. Uh, sorry, the, the Mac and Josh on Twitter, is that right? Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I'd actually like to, you know, we're all professionals here. I want to keep yeah. it a little more professional okay. uh, this time, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, you can find me on LinkedIn. Okay, so you're on no. LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, where, how how can people find you? I think you just have to have a professional connection to me to find me. <laughs> I don't really know how people find anybody on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's LinkedIn's just, a little little weird. So just keep an eye on your LinkedIn. If I'm a suggested con, you know, connection, okay, just take advantage. So of it. yeah, if you're connected to to Sam or I on LinkedIn, maybe it'll suddenly pop up the Mac and Josh. Right. You'd be like, oh, yeah, I maybe. know that guy. Otherwise, just Josh Windish, I guess. <laughs> All, right. All right. Sounds good, Josh. Thank you again for your help. Thanks to Burke and everybody else for helping us do this show each and every week. Thanks to you for watching. We'll see you all next week on Know How. And now that you know how, put it up on the screen. Bye.